This podcast was created during the 2023 WGA and SAG after strikes. Fortunately for us, the WGA seems to have reached a tentative agreement with AMTPT. However, SAG after has not yet. So please continue to support the Entertainment Community Fund. You'll find the link in the show notes. Thanks. Morgays, the Queen of Andor, has issued the following proclamation. This podcast shall be discussing the most recent episode of Wheel of Time. If you have not seen that episode and do not wish to be spoiled, go witness the Dragon Reborn in the latest episode and then return. So it is written, so shall it be done. Welcome back to Bust and Blockbusters, a very abbreviated edition of Bust and Blockbusters. Matt here with you, and I apologize for this. This is just kind of an initial reaction to the Wheel of Time, Season 2, Episode 8. Not even going to give you all of the information about the episode because I just finished watching it, and I just want to get my thoughts out and get them to Bubba and get them to you guys as quickly as possible. As I mentioned last week, we cannot do a regular discussion podcast this week. Of course, the finale, just because of the way my schedule worked out, uh, which is just one of those things. So you just get me for this very short initial reaction to The Wheel of Time, Season 2, Episode 8. And I loved this finale. So let's get right into my rating. All hail the court of Morgay's Queen of Andor is now in session. Hail. Hail. The Queen will now hear proclamations of ratings for this episode of Wheel of Time. So I'm probably being a little bit of a prisoner of the moment right now because I just saw the episode and everything, but I'm going to give it 9.4 out of 10, what I like to call double S's. That stands for shattered seals because all the shields are shattered, baby. All the forsaken are in the world. How great is this? I love that when we saw Ishmael dust his hands off and I was like what does that mean what does that even mean and then we don't find out until the end of the episode when we meet yet another forsaken you get rid of one now you get six more uh that's the way that this world works baby I love that they're all out there now which is kind of like the way they were in the books I mean they were all kind of out there Uh, anyway the breaking of the seals and the emergence of forsaken is something that the show I originally thought was just adapting instead of doing the release of the Dark One, who we still haven't met yet, folks. Sorry to tell you, spoiler alert, you haven't met the Dark One yet. No, Rand hasn't won. There's still a whole lot of things to do before perhaps that we'll even see the Dark One. So this is the way that it goes. We've got a whole bunch of you know top level bosses but not the big boss out there in the video game now and i love it that was the wonderful reveal at the end of mogidian who is one of my favorite forsakens um lanfear is also of course a favorite but mogidian is just so mean and and i you even see her being that way with Lanfair. Uh, by the way, in the old tongue, Mogidian stands uh, basically equates to spider. Uh, and so that's why uh, you saw her with Lanfair at the end using a, a weave that essentially created kind of like a spider web around Lanfair. Loved it. I don't think that this Mogidian is kind of the, exactly the way that I pictured her in the books. Uh, but I'm I'm here for this. I can't wait to see what we get in season three. They really 
powered up Egwene. They changed a little bit of the way that she got away. Um, and that's cool with me. I know a lot of people are going to get out there that I just don't, I don't understand how you can have a lack of humanity. They'll say, this is too woke, too much Egwene, too much power for Egwene. Screw you, man. I loved what they did for powering up Egwene in this. When you saw what an amazing job that Madeline did with the way that episode six went, I mean, you got to give this girl everything in her power to come back from that as best she can. And no, you can't have this kind of magical redemption or whatever, but they did show how she was still very determined in episode seven in that scene. Um, I'm not sure exactly how I feel about Egwene going to the lengths that she did, but I could certainly understand the motivation behind that for the character. So I'm cool with that, and I loved it. Um, her standing up against Ishmael, uh, the whole group coming together to stand up against Ishmael, that's something that is very different than is from the books in a way because they're all kind of off fighting their own little battles everywhere. But we saw that too in this episode, and I loved that. We did see Lanfear use that kind of alternate type of traveling. Uh, I don't want to use, I'm, I'm going to try to be very careful with the words here because there are things that I've explained in the book parts of our podcast that I don't uh, know that I should be detailing too much because they might get into more of this of the show, but the way they just kind of disappeared from the ways uh, and then they were separated and that was kind of weird for me. Um, I guess they're just showing Rand showing up a few minutes later. Speaking of Rand, what a great episode for him too. Um, the heron mark on his hand, that is something that is from the books too. It's from one of the prophecies where it says, uh, twice shall he be branded. Uh, well, we saw one of those brands and I guess I've given a spoiler away that it should happen twice. Uh, so will he be branded in another way uh, on the other hand or somewhere else? Maybe so. Uh, he did end up with a wound in his side the same way that he does in book two, although by a very different method. And a lot of the interpretations of the book or the way they had to change it to make it more accessible for a television show, I didn't have any problem with at all. My rating's just gone on and on and on, hasn't it? I probably should shut up right now and just get to uh, our sponsor for the ratings this particular episode. Uh, we got to take you to Spawn Center. So it is written, so shall it be done. Hey. This is Spawn Center. Da -da -da, da -da -da. Good morning. It's Get Up. Greeny here with you once again on Spawn Center. As we talk about this final game of the season, we bring in once again Coach Trollic. Coach T, thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me, Greeny. It's great to be back. Missed you guys. Been busy doing a season, although there wasn't much for us to do. We had lots of injuries. Kept us on the sidelines quite a bit. We did not perform quite to spec. Now, Coach, I haven't talked to anybody. I haven't seen anything. I don't really ever know anything, but I just run my mouth until I get to a point where I can say, it seems to me that at this time, there was a thorough defeat of the Sean Chan. That's correct, Greeny. Uh, I credit it to a play that actually was designed a long time ago, but not too many coaches use it anymore. Uh, hats off to Team Tavirin for resurrecting this play that I like to call the Horn of Valir. That single play seems to have made the Sean Chan to act not unlike a quarterback that we've heard of before, literally seeing ghosts on the field. Yes, Greeny, I believe that was your quarterback, Sam Darnold, for the Jets. I don't want to talk about the Jets. We're just having another year. 
Yeah, the Jets are kind of having the same kind of luck as the Trollocs this year. But it seems to me that if this play is so successful, why haven't teams been using it? Well, Greeny, all I can tell you is that this is a play that is very rare. It only works ever so once in a while. Most defenses catch on to that right away. In this case, the Sean Shan did not, as you could clearly see. But if you have all of the right ingredients together, like having the Horn of Valir, it can be a truly devastating play. As we have seen. Thank you, Coach, for joining me for that analysis. And I don't know anything. I haven't talked to anybody. I don't know what I'm saying right now, but I will keep talking until I can finally get out the word. But it seems to me that our time for this segment is over. So we'll be right back on Get Up, where since my Jets have fallen apart, we have resumed talking about the Lakers. We're on day 30. Be right back. All right. Thanks, Greedy and Coach T, for that version of Spawn Center. I just have a few more things to say. As I said, this will be a very abbreviated portion of the podcast. I'm kind of disappointed in the fact that Nynaeve's episode I mean, the really episode that got me and got me rooting for her came so early. And then she's not really had much in terms of agency since. I understand her being so angry with that Sudam and the way that that was powering up her connection and making it really tough on that Sudam, who, you know, I mean, this culture is awful. So to see what happens to Rena, to see what happens to this Suldam. It's difficult for me because I'm in this position. Well, they're a human being also. Can't you teach them to not do the things that they've been doing? But at the same time, this Suldam was being very resistant and still looking down upon Nynaeve in a way. There was a big change in the fact that they reveal that Suldam's can channel there was a slight change in that also because really what it is is that sudoms have the potential to be taught in the books but instead here they're kind of just saying that they can channel but it's so weak that they were never detected by other Dabani and not made into Dabani's themselves uh all of that it's i'm i'm cool with uh but that revelation that sudoms have the ability to channel or the potential to channel is something that uh, isn't revealed until like book four or maybe even book five. So them bringing that forward uh, gave them the out to be able to have Egwene be able to get herself out of her situation as opposed to having to be rescued by anybody. So I liked the fact that they use something kind of from the books in order to make that happen, which gave Egwene a lot of her agency back as well in this episode. And again, I don't have any problem with it. Heroes, let's talk about Matt, because this is just brilliant. Now, one thing that I don't like about it is because it seems like they've really powered up Matt after blowing the horn. I don't know if we're going to get uh, something that book readers know as foxes and snakes. I don't know if we're going to see doorways, stuff that I talked about in book podcasts or book sections of this podcast earlier this season. I think that would be very disappointing if we don't get that stuff, because I think it's one of the coolest parts about the development of Matt's character. But that sudden change of his ability to suddenly speak in the old tongue really well, uh, like everybody in the, the of the Heroes of the Horn already knew who he was. Um, and even the creation of this spear. There's a particular spear that some of this foxes and snakes stuff develops that gives him a very special uh, spear at the end of all of that trek. And now I think that maybe some of that's just dropped and what he has done is he's using this blade, uh, the Shadar Logoth blade, in order to 
uh, create this this spear that we know from in the books. So it's a good possibility that they're going to skip all of this. But at the same time, that's the cleverness of Matt, the ability to use the spear in the way that he did, the way the the way that he got that dagger and created that spear. I was cheering and rooting and everything. Speaking of which, I mean, as far as Pat and Fane goes, holy cow, uh, that's maybe the most words we've heard that actor speak uh, in the whole series so far. I think he more than tripled the amount of words that he had. Although that scene at the end of season one was pretty good. Uh, it seems like they got to wait till the end of a season, a season finale uh, to give Pat and Fane a monologue or at least a good scene. And that was great. I, I loved that interplay between him and Matt. And, uh, and again, I just fist pumped when Matt figured it all out. I thought that was super, super fantastic. Who am I missing here? Oh, Elaine and Rand meet up. And uh, she's the one who ends up healing his wound in the side that I spoke about earlier that's from the books. Again, that comes from a different thing. That whole battle in the tower is completely different than the way that Rand and Ishmael fight. And I don't know that I really want, I want you to read the books too, to be perfectly honest. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm not going to comment about what the difference is with that, other than the fact that it's kind of Rand and Ishmael mano y mano. So I think that uh, the way that they're doing this is they are making it so that these five Taviran, so to speak, uh, are more of a team tandem. I mean, it is the Dragon Reborn. They're Rand. He has the, he's the one guy that has to do it, so to speak. But um, I love how they're making each part important and uh the, the your your five Taviran again are Perrin, Matt, Rand, Egwene, and Nynaeve. Um not necessarily in any one particular order uh over the other, except I guess you might have to rank Rand first since he is the Dragon Reborn. The flashback. I loved the flashback as well. I'm gonna speak about that as long as we're talking about the dragon. Uh Luce Theron uh, and they had mentioned before the whole similarity between the friendship uh, of Luz Theron and Lanfear and uh, Ishmael, how they were all uh, the closest of these three very powerful wielders of the one power. I think that the way that they used that, you know, that scene from 3000 years ago was very well done. For one thing, it kind of changes the lore in the way that the Forsaken ended up uh, being locked away for the amount of time. And I like that idea that they've introduced rather than them guys, them those Forsaken uh, in the books, I will say this, in they are actually kind of just happened to be at the right place at the right time when Luz Theron goes after the Dark One. And because of that, uh, they end up getting trapped. Here, they've made it like it was a conscious effort, a conscious action to get each of these Forsaken off of the board. And you can assume that what we saw with Ishmael happened with each one of them. Uh, maybe at the same time, maybe not. I'm not exactly sure. But uh, I loved that little change and just the way that they built up that friendship between Lucerne, between the dragon and Ishmael. I love the way that Ishmael went away. Ashes, baby. Nothing more. Will Ishmael be back? That's one question that I have because. It doesn't seem to me that the show did a very good job of doing all this explaining that Lanfear can't die, but Ishmael can. 
it doesn't really make sense when you think about those kind of things. So that was something that kind of took a little bit off of my score as well. Other than that, I mean, Lauren Balfe's score was absolutely magnificent. I'll definitely have a breakdown on some of that stuff. The, the treatments of Egwene's theme, especially, and I know I've been talking an awful lot about Egwene's theme this season and probably too much, but there was some really great stuff that really demonstrated how a singular melody can represent a character and how different types of harmonies or the way that the melody is played can make you feel different emotions when you hear that theme and understand kind of psychologically because you you hear that melody underneath that character scene so much understand what is happening to that character as a result of the harmony being applied and uh th so there'll be some of that there'll be lots more breakdown i think i think we should talk about some of, of matt's stuff as well when we get to that and i have rambled and rambled and rambled i will get to your feedback i promise you we will get to your feedback we will have a podcast in about one week from the release of this one where we will go through this with a fine tooth comb rather than me just rambling for 20 minutes or so and we'll have priscilla and bubba with us we'll try to have some fun as well and i'll do a full musical analysis we'll have your feedback i want to hear what you thought about this finale as well you can send posts to me on x twitter at bust blockbuster you can also send them to at the word double the letters phq in fact you can use that spelling for all kinds of social media on x twitter on instagram on threads also facebook facebook.com slash the word double the letters phq and we love it when you leave comments on the YouTube. We've got some great comments from last week's episode on the YouTube, which we will be covering in the future. Definitely check that out. Subscribe to the podcast. Hit the like button for my videos. Hit the like buttons for every video there that you watch. And hit that notification bell, yo, as John McGonagall insists that I say, in order to reach that younger demographic, because I ain't young. Uh, but yeah, get the notifications so you get videos on all kinds of great television shows. We just wrapped up Ahsoka, just wrapped up Only Murders in the Building, or are about to wrap up Only Murders in the Building. I guess Bubba might have one more video that he's going to do. And uh, there's all kinds of other great shows coming up that we will be talking about as well. Have I rambled enough? Oh, one more thing. Uh, if you get this podcast in time, and you should at least get it one day early, you have until October 7th to enter our contest. There is a YouTube video posted on my social media, uh, X Twitter, at Bus Blockbuster. You can watch the video there or go to the YouTube video page. I'll have that link in the show notes. If you find, if you can figure out which four television shows that the five book covers that are in the background of that video are put them down in that comment or again you can tweet me x tweet me if that just sounds weird send a post to me on x twitter at bust blockbuster or you can send emails to matt's audio blog at gmail.com just watch that video figure out the four television shows that each of those books are based on Again, there's five covers. One is used twice. They're just two different covers for the same book. And you will be entered into a contest to win a $100 gift certificate from Amazon. I mean, you don't have to buy Wheel of Time stuff from Amazon. Use it for whatever you want. It's on me. I don't have a partnership with Amazon. I don't make any money off of these podcasts. I don't ask for any money. The only payment I ask for is your feedback. So please let me know what you thought of these episodes and we will be back in one week to wrap this season up completely including a fine tooth comb discussion of season two episode eight when we return thanks for watching or for listening depending on what medium you're getting this on it has been a great season i've appreciated all of your thoughts all of your corrections 
And uh, I can't wait to talk to Bubba and Priscilla about this. Take care. Send emails to Matt's audio blog at gmail.com and find all back episodes and other information at Matt's audioblog.com. Part of Double P Media, doublepmedia.com.